Now, Margaret and I each have a couple of pairs of glasses. I um, have my indoor glasses that I use for reading, and then I have a, a dark pair when I'm out in the sun. And Margaret has the same. And we have opposite problems. Um, I'm always forgetting my sunglasses, so I'm going out and I'm driving, and it's like, oh, I forgot my sunglasses, oh what? And Margaret has this habit of forgetting to take off her sunglasses, and so she comes inside, and of course everything's dark. Well, the thing about wearing sunglasses all the time is it changes how things look. You know, things, everything looks darker. Nothing looks as sharp as it does. And that's a bit like having a, a mental illness or a depression. It makes things look differently. Things look worse. You're not capable of seeing things as they really are. Uh, and so when... You know, as we're talking about Mental Health Week, uh, when you're talking to someone who's struggling with a mental illness, um, you can't tell them to stop it. You can't tell them to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, you can't tell them just to be happy, you know, like, oh, gee, I never thought of that, you know? It's because they can't see it. It's just not possible for them to see it like that. Um, and I think this, the passage that we're going to look at this morning... Um, I'm going to have to find where it is now. This is all out of order. Uh, the passage that we're going to look at this morning um, is, a, is a great one because... Uh, you're going to have to find it for me. Sorry there, Alex. My sermon thing. Um, because... Um, how do I switch this over, mate? Because uh, this is a passage that tells us who we really are, even though we don't always see it ourselves. And so it's a very positive passage. Uh, and, you know, it's, in, it's important to have a, a proper look at who you are. Uh, now, I believe that, like everyone, I've been blessed with certain gifts. One of them is not gardening. Um, Funnily enough, when I was going through Bible college, I had a part-time job uh, at my kids' primary school doing kind of handyman maintenance work, which I really wasn't very qualified to do. And part of that uh, also involved looking after the gardens, which I definitely had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, and, you, and I'd have to prune stuff, you know, and keep the gardens neat and everything. Uh, and they called me Mr. Hack and Slash. Um, <laughs> So gardening is definitely not one of my gifts. Nowadays, I leave gardening for people who have those gifts. Or when we're at home, you know, I might carry the stuff and then Margaret will do the gardening. Uh, we've got to leave, leave the people who have the gifts. And one of the frustrating things about when you're gardening um, is it's not quite as bad in WA because we're mostly kind of a coastal plain. But in other places, like when you were living in Sydney, there's just rocks everywhere. And, you know, you really hate it when you get the shovel and you go, go in expecting it to be a nice big bite of dirt and you hit a rock and kind of jars all the way up your arm. Rocks aren't very much fun. In, um, in some countries, like in, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, where Margaret and I went last year, there's a... Um, They've got a lot of rocks, and so when they're clearing their fields, they've got to remove all these rocks before they can start planting. And so they, they build all these little rock walls everywhere, and it's kind of less about keeping the sheep in and more about basically just getting the rocks out of the way to create space for gardening. And when we read this passage here, Peter uses the word stone or rock about nine times in just seven verses. So, you know, when, the, when someone tells you something repeatedly, do you think they've really got something to say? And for us, stones might be a nuisance that get in the way, but for the first century Jews who knew their scripture, stone carried a lot of meaning. Uh, in the previous passage, uh, Peter began to talk to us as Christians and say that we're like babies who need the milk of God's word. And then all of a sudden he makes this shift and starts talking about rocks. But it's not as big a turn as you might think. So, for instance, if you go right back to Genesis, um, when 
uh, Abraham was promised to, you know, children and a great nation, and they lost faith. And so Abraham's wife said, you know, why don't you take uh, my, my maid, Hagar, and have a child through her? And she says, perhaps I can build a family through her. Or in the, in the Hebrew, what it actually says is, may I be built through her. To obtain children means that you become a house. And a house needs to be built. And so the transition between babies and building a house uh, is not as awkward as it might at first appear to us. And then, of course, there's the link to Peter himself. Um, When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? Simon answered him, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, "Blessed, blessed are you, Simon, And then he gave him a new name. He said, I tell you that you are Peter, you are Petros, and on this rock, this Petra, I will build my church. So Jesus is using a play on words, and, you know, we see that a lot in the Bible. They use a play on words. You know, you are Petros, and upon this Petra, you are Peter, and upon this rock. But the trouble with Peter, the rock, is also that a rock can become a stumbling stone. So a few verses later, when Peter tried to prevent Jesus from going to the cross, Jesus had to say to him, Peter, get behind me, you are a stumbling block to me. So this illustration that Peter uses in this passage of rocks and stumbling stones, it was all very personal to Peter. Now, the trouble when you read this passage is that Peter uses the word stones and the word rocks in different ways. And it's almost like he, he kind of keeps switching the metaphor and it can be a little bit hard to follow. But we shall go through it one step at a time uh, and we shall dig into this passage. That's a dad joke for you. We're going to dig into this passage. Come to him that living stone. Humans rejected him, but God chose him and values him very highly. Like living stones yourselves, you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that will be well-pleasing to God through Jesus the Messiah. Peter flips this metaphor three times in two verses. Now, Let's just go back in history a little bit, back to the book of Chronicles. We read about how the nations of Israel and Judah were conquered. Their temple was destroyed and the people were scattered throughout the world. And the great hope of Israel was that God would bring them back and he would rebuild their temple. They eventually did build a small temple after the exile, but then that got destroyed again. And then... Herod built another temple and that got destroyed again. And so there's still this hope and you hear a lot from people who kind of like prophecy sort of stuff. They're always talking about, oh, the temple being rebuilt again. Uh, And to rebuild the temple, you have to start with a cornerstone. That's where you've got to start. And so you can see there's a cornerstone on that building there. That's where you you get the cornerstone first and then you start to build the rest off it. But one word that you don't normally associate with stone is living, is it? I mean, you pick up a rock and you don't think, oh, this is living. You know, I'll take this home and I'll feed it or whatever, you know. It's inert, it doesn't do anything. And yet Peter talks about Jesus as being a living cornerstone. So that means that Peter is not really talking about a physical building here so much as a spiritual one. Uh, in fact, when you look at the, um, the Hebrew word for stone, it is eben, E-B-E-N which is very close to the word for sun, which is ben, B-E-N. So sun is ben, stone is eben. 
And, and so Jesus used that play on words when he told his parable in Mark chapter 12. He told this story about the son who was rejected and then he quotes Psalm 118 and says that it was the stone that was rejected. So there's that play on words again. And throughout prophecy there is this link between the sun and the stone. Uh, and so we read, look, I'm setting up in Zion a chosen precious cornerstone. Believe in him and you'll not be ashamed. So I'm setting up a stone but you have to believe in him. So the he is the stone. The stone is the coming Messiah. But then Peter flips this metaphor on its head and suddenly he's talking about us. We are the living stones. Like, okay, so we are becoming part of this temple of which Christ is the cornerstone. And then just to make it more confusing for us, Peter twists the metaphor yet again and suddenly he says that we are priests in that temple. So we are living stones, these stones become a temple and then we become priests inside that temple. See, it's because he's not talking about a physical building. He's not talking about this. This is not the church. This is a building. This is bricks and mortar and whatever they have on the roof and whatever you have on the floor and the carpet. It's not the church. The church is us. We are the living stones. The key difference between the old temple and the new temple is that we are part of it. And in the old temple, people had to go in and they had to go to the Ark of the Covenant and they had to offer physical sacrifices. Whereas now Peter talks about us offering spiritual sacrifices. This is not just a fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy, but it's actually a prophecy that Jesus made of himself. Uh, when he spoke to a Samaritan woman at the well, he said, uh, that this woman turned to him and said, our ancestors, that's the ancestors of the Samaritans, used to worship on this mountain. But you Jews claim that we must worship on that mountain over there in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on that mountain or that one. A time is coming, and in fact it has now come, when true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. See, God is no longer limited to appearing above an ark, behind a curtain, inside a tabernacle or a temple. The church, us, we are now that living house in which God lives. We are both the house and we are the priests in that house. And as priests, we offer spiritual sacrifices. We offer praise and worship to God. We offer practical loving service to each other. Just as Haley said in her testimony about how people had done these practical loving things for her when she was down right that's that's the spiritual sacrifices that we offer and it's also our praise and worship uh, hebrew says through jesus let us continually offer to god a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and don't forget to do good and share with others because with these sacrifices god is well pleased So God no longer lives in a temple in Jerusalem, but in this spiritual house made of spiritual stones, living stones, and it's being built all over the world. So Yochai Baptist Church is not the church. The universal worldwide church is the church of which we are part. But this creates a problem for some people because for people who reject Jesus as the cornerstone, he becomes a stumbling stone. So Peter says, he is indeed precious for you believers. So Jesus is precious to us, right? But when people don't believe, the stone that reject, with the builders rejected and became the cornerstone is a, stumbling, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. 
Stones are great. You can do all sorts of things with stone. You can build roads with them. You can build houses with them. You can do all sorts of things. But a stone out of place causes people to stumble. And if there's anyone that knows about stumbling, it's me. Look at this. Hobbling around. (laughs) Because stones that you stumble on cause you injury. See, many people don't really have a problem with you having this kind of general belief in, in God. Oh, yeah, you believe in God, that's okay. But when you start preaching the name of Jesus, well, that's when they start to become offended. That's when they start to, to see Jesus as a stumbling stone. What do you mean? Oh, I can believe in God, but what, I have to go through Jesus? Oh, no, no, not doing that, not doing that. And so in Corinthians we read that Jews look for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we announce a crucified Messiah. It's a scandal to the Jews, it's folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called it is God's power and God's wisdom. You see, we can't avoid causing offence. The name of Jesus itself is offensive to some people. Just saying the name of Jesus Christ will be a stumbling block. But I believe it's our responsibility as Christians not to put any other stumbling blocks in the way of people coming to Jesus. So, for instance, uh, a man who described himself as a a working-class, uneducated bloke once said to a pastor, he said, do you have any idea how long it took me to even be able to listen to the gospel? It's because the gospel was always preached by these educated people who all dressed so fine and spoke differently and they showed that they really didn't like me or people like me or the places that I lived. You know, it it was as though people had put these stumbling blocks in the way. And we do that too. I'm sure that wasn't deliberate for the most part. I'm sure the people that preached the gospel like that didn't intend to create extra stumbling blocks for that man. But they did. And we can't afford to put other stumbling blocks in people's paths. You know, we can't sort of say, oh, well, you know, you're not going to be welcome in our church unless you change the way you dress. Well, I don't like the way you're living over here. You can't expect unregenerate people to live like spirit-filled believers. That happens after. You know, we can't start putting stumbling blocks in the way of people. We need to bring people to Jesus and then the Holy Spirit will work in their lives and start to transform them. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul says, I'm not going to put any stumbling block in your way of coming to Jesus. In the ancient world, in the pagan world in particular, um, people would like to declare the wonderful acts of their gods. Uh, This is why the Caesars would hold these victory parades, right? They would have a a victory in a war somewhere across the other half of the world and they'd come back to Rome and they'd have this giant victory parade and talk about their enormous achievements because Caesar thought of himself as God and they were declaring that. Well, Peter says that the, the purpose of our calling as a holy priesthood is to declare God's mighty works. Peter starts to expand here on what he means by spiritual sacrifices. See, God doesn't want us to be sacrificing animals at an altar. He wants us to be talking about his mighty works, to spread his good news, to share the gospel, declaring his works of salvation. uh, So Peter begins... Peter puts it like this. Hang on, here we go. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession. Your purpose is to announce the virtuous deeds of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. 
you know, it's a, um, it's, an, it's another in, image, another illustration P- Peter starts to use here, is darkness to light. And it's often used to describe the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the enemy. Uh, and so when Jesus talked about the ministry of John the Baptist, um, he quoted from the Old Testament uh, book of Isaiah when he said, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Though on those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. In other words, this whole world is under the domain of Satan and it's living in darkness and it desperately needs God's light to come in. So where does this light come from and what in the world has it got to do with stones? Well, if you look in... Um, back in the Old Testament, the high priest wore this golden breastplate that had 12 precious stones on it, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And these stones reflected light. So, like, you can look up in the night sky and you can see the moon. But the moon doesn't have any light. All the moon does is it reflects the light from the sun. Right? When we look at the moon, what we're actually seeing is the sun's light. We're not seeing the light from the moon itself. And so these stones that the high priest wore reflected light. So the, the, people, the people of Israel never got to go into God's holy presence. We talked a bit about that last week. And so God's light, God's presence would dwell above the ark behind the, that veil in the Holy of Holies. But what would happen would be that the high priest would come out and when he would do his sacrifices and his, perform his priestly duties, the sun would glisten and shine off this gold and off all these precious jewels. It must have been something to see. But none of those stones had light. What they did was they reflected the sun's light. And it was meant to show that the high priest reflects the glory of God. So that even though they couldn't see God firsthand, they couldn't step into God's presence in the way that the high priest did, they got to see God's reflected glory. And then to to stress this, this image of darkness and light, Peter picks up a passage from Hosea chapter 2. And he turns it into a very simple little poem, just to show us that the gospel is not really that complicated. And Peter sums up the gospel like this. Once you were no people, now you were God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. That is the simplicity of the gospel message. That's why we are called. And that's our priestly duty, to share that message. So Peter goes a little bit wild in this passage with all these metaphors and illustrations and switching back and forth. You know, he calls Christ our living stone. And he calls him the cornerstone of our building. Then he calls us living stones who have been built into a house for God, a temple. And then he starts talking about us being priests within that temple. Paul uses very similar imagery in his writings. He says, through Christ, we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. With Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Isn't that a precious, precious thing? to say about us. Now, maybe when you rocked up this morning, I don't know, maybe your kids were messing up. Maybe you were just running late and you were a bit frustrated. Maybe you've been struggling with a bit of depression or whatever during the week. Maybe you just, you get here this morning and you kind of think, I I don't feel like that. I don't think I look like that. And yet, Peter tells us that is exactly who we are people who make the spiritual sacrifice of declaring his glory and his salvation 
this salvation that has rescued us from darkness and brought us into light. And like the high priest, we shine with God's reflected glory. You see, so you don't have to go around going, hey, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. That's not what we're about. We're not about reflecting our own glory. We're about reflecting God's glory. And it's not always going to be easy. You know, people are comfortable in their darkness. The name of Jesus is a stumbling block for them. Yet that's the challenge we've been given. And as we, need to, as we do that, we need to be careful not to put any other stumbling block in people's way. We don't try and change them. We don't try and force our lifestyle upon them. We preach, as Paul said, only Christ crucified. And the Holy Spirit will begin their work in them soon enough. And so like Peter, we keep a very simple gospel message, which is just declaring what God has done for us. Uh, and so I've modified Peter's words to give us a very simple gospel message. Once I was nothing, now I'm a child of God. Once I was lost, now God's mercy has found me. Once I lived in darkness, now my life is filled with light. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we, we thank you for Peter's words. Um, as difficult as it sometimes is to pick up on all the, the imagery and the images that he uses, uh, we, we hopefully get a glimpse of who you declare us to be. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be part of your special holy temple. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to build your worldwide church on us. And thank you that you've given us the opportunity, Lord, of being priests who declare your righteousness. <laughs>